Welcome to this Medicine Masterclass in which we will be having a case-based discussion about atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is an irregular heartbeat, an arrhythmia, that can lead to blood clots, stroke, heart failure and other complications. It's the most common sustained cardiac arrhythmia, more common in men, and the prevalence increases with age. Let's take a case-based approach. Mr. John presents with palpitations. What features would we expect on examination? And then we'll have a case-based discussion. On inspection, in lone, pre, in lone atrial fibrillation, the precordium would appear normal with no scars. On palpation, the apex beat would be expected in its normal anatomical position. That's the fifth intercostal space left midclavicular line. The apex beat would be irregular. On auscultation, S1 and S2 would be present and heard irregularly. S1 corresponds to the closure of the mitral and tricuspid valve, and S1 would have variable intensity. And the intensity is inversely proportional to the RR interval, meaning that the faster the heart rate, the louder the sound, and the quieter the sound in a slow heart rate. And no additional heart sounds or murmurs would be audible. Peripherally, the pulse would be irregular and a rate should be calculated, i.e. between 65 and 80 beats per minute. And you may also note a pulse deficit. A pulse deficit is a difference between the rate of the apex and the pulse rate. And that's because not every stroke volume would produce a palpable radial pulse due to the irregular nature and sometimes very quick nature of um, the contraction of the heart. The JVP would be noted, but A waves would be absent. If they have other conditions, such as mitral valve disease or mitral stenosis, you may notice a malar flush, or if they've had correction to their mitral valve disease, a mitral valvulotomy scar may be present. Precipitating factors, so if they are thyrotoxic, they may appear warm, they may have sweaty hands, signs of Graves' disease such as exophthalmos, a goiter or pretibial myxedema may be present. It's important to recognise that not every irregular pulse is atrial fibrillation. Other differentials would include sinus arrhythmia, in which a P wave is present but you have an irregularly irregular R into RR interval, premature ventricular complexes, and second degree heart block with variable responses and an ECG would be able to discern these conditions. So putting all this together, we would say Mr or Mrs Jones presents with palpitations. The patient was comfortable at rest and I believe the patient has signs consistent with atrial fibrillation. On inspection, the precordium appears normal with no scars. The apex beat was not displaced and palpable in the fifth intercostal space, left midclavicular line, but was noted to be irregular. S1 and S2 were present, but S1 was a variable intensity inversely related to the RR cycle. No additional heart sounds or murmurs were heard, and a JVP without A waves was noted. The pulse was regular between irregular between 64 and 80 beats per minute, with no radio radial or radiofemoral delay, but a pulse deficit was present. My differentials would include atrial fibrillation, sinus arrhythmia, atrial extrasystoles or secondary heart block with variable response or premature ventricular complexes, as well as other conditions such as hypothyroidism. And to distinguish an irregular pulse or the pulse of atrial fibrillation from ventricular ectopics, if the patient is exercised, exercise will diminish the, the ventricular ectopics, but the ECG is the key investigation of choice. So how do we classify atrial fibrillation? Atrial fibrillation can be described as paroxysmal, where the arrhythmia terminates spontaneously, usually within seven days, without any treatment. Persistent AF is where the arrhythmia is sustained beyond seven days. Long-standing is where the arrhythmia is present for more than a year. And permanent is a term that is used to identify individuals with persistent atrial fibrillation, where a joint decision between the patient and the clinician is made to no longer pursue a rhythm control strategy, and usually is refractory to the interventions that have been made. Secondary AF is following an event such as an acute myocardial infarction, secondary to conditions such as hyperthyroidism, cardiac surgery, myocarditis or pericarditis, infection, sepsis, PE, or, uh, or other acute diseases. And lone atrial fibrillation is, a pre is, 
atrial fibrillation in the absence of any other cardiopulmonary disease, including hypertension, in young patients less than 60 years old. And these are patients who have a very low risk of developing a stroke. What are the causes? Atrial fibrillation can be idiopathic or secondary to ischemic heart disease, hypertension, valvular disease, thyrotoxicosis, or other cardiorespiratory conditions. To investigate these patients, an FBC and eusinase would help determine whether the presence of infection, anemia, or whether there are electrolyte abnormalities that are causing the heart to enter this uh, abnormal rhythm. Thyroid function tests are very important, particularly looking at the T3, T4, and TSH to determine whether or not the patient is hyperthyroid. A CRP and an ESI to help determine whether the presence of infection and blood cultures uh, are also important in to determine whether there's any organisms causing sepsis. To diagnose atrial fibrillation, an ECG should be performed in all people, whether they are symptomatic or not, in which uh, you suspect atrial fibrillation from an irregular pulse or clinical findings. In patients with paroxysmal or suspected paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, where uh, the ECG is normal, offer a longer recording of the heart using a 24-hour tape or a 48 or 72-hour tape. And in patients where uh, you're still missing uh, the arrhythmia and you suspect the arrhythmia, you can offer a loop recorder. The ECG would demonstrate absent P waves, fibrillatory F waves, which are very fast, irregular waves seen at 350 to 600 beats per minute, an irregularly irregular RR interval, and a narrow QRS. The ECG could also allow you to pick up other arrhythmias and to determine whether or not there's any underlying ischemia precipitating or driving this arrhythmia. An echocardiogram is important to help determine the overall structure of the heart, the cardiac contractility, the ejection fraction, and the patient may require a transesophageal echo to exclude the development of a thrombus in the left atrial appendage. To manage patients with atrial fibrillation, a holistic, patient-centered approach with the involvement of a multidisciplinary team would be required, with conservative medical and interventional options being presented. Rhythm control strategies is where an antiarrhythmic drug can be used, as well as percutaneous catheter ablation or even a surgical procedure. The patient may require electrical cardioversion to restore sinus rhythm, and antiarrhythmic medications are generally started before cardioversion to help maintain sinus rhythm. Rate control are drugs that are used to slow the heart rate down in patients who are developing fast atrial fibrillation, and these include beta blockers and calcium channel blockers. Interestingly, the data suggests that whether you take a rhythm control or a rate control strategy, there are similar rates of mortality or serious morbidity. The other key a feature to think about in atrial fibrillation is when the atria are fibrillating and not contracting and therefore there's relative stasis of blood which using Verkhoff's triad is a risk factor for the development of blood clots um, is to manage and mitigate the risk of the development of a, uh, of a thrombus. If a thrombus does develop the sites of potential embolism include the brain, which can result in a stroke, leg resulting in a DVT, the superior mesenteric artery, which could result in a mesenteric angina, coronary artery resulting in an MI, a spleen resulting in a splenic infarct, or the lungs resulting in a pulmonary embolus. So the, com the complications are very severe. And so there are strategies that can be used to reduce the risk of the development of a stroke. And this is the use of anticoagulants. We can use vitamin K antagonists such as warfarin or the NOAX or DOAX, such as apixaban, dabigatron, revoroxaban and edoxaban. In order to offer anticoagulation, patients are risk stratified using a CHADVAS score um, as well as a HASBLED score. The CHADVAS score stratifies patients in terms of their risk of developing a stroke and the HASBLED score stratifies risk of patients bleeding. And so by using these two scores, um, an anticoagulation strategy can be offered to the patient. Generally, a CHADVAS score more than one in a male or more than two in a female uh, indicate the, the, the requirement to anticoagulate the patient uh, so long as there are not serious risks.
Uh, here is an important slide. Uh, traditionally, aspirin and warfarin were used to mitigate the risk of a clot. However, the 2007 BAFTA study showed that um, all strokes were reduced using warfarin compared to aspirin in a statistically significant manner. However, bleeding risk was the same. So as a result, monotherapy was no longer offered for the uh, sole prevention of uh, stroke in patients with atrial fibrillation. So that left the VKA or warfarin. Warfarin itself has a narrow therapeutic index um, and requires a very tight INR range. Too high increases the risk of bleeding and too low increases the risk of a stroke. Also, we know that due to the pharmacodynamics and the processing of this drug, there's huge variability in dose response due to genetic variations and also the warfarin interacts with a number of other drugs as well as alcohol and the patient's diet and so patients require very frequent monitoring which uh, can be considered inconvenient and costly and and warfarin has a long half-life a slow onset and offset and requires uh, perioperative uh, bridging and anticoagulation so as a result of that, newer drugs uh, called the NOAX or novel oral anticoagulants or the direct oral anticoagulants are used. These have a rapid onset of action, um, no major significant food-food interactions for most of these drugs, low potential or lower potential for drug-drug interactions, although there are many drug-drug interactions that you should be aware of. And importantly, they, they do not require routine coagulation monitoring like warfarin did. So NICE recommends anticoagulation with NOACs within their license indications are an option for preventing stroke and systemic embolism in patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation, that's atrial fibrillation um, in, the, in the presence, uh, well, in the absence of metallic valves or mitral stenosis with an additional risk factor such as a stroke, increased age, uh, hypertension, diabetes, mellitus. Um, this slide, demonstrates the various mechanisms of action. Warfarin is a vitamin K uh, inhibitor, whereas the apixaban, ravroxaban, and idoxaban, which contain X in their name, are direct factor 10A inhibitors. Dabigatron, on the other hand, is a direct thrombin inhibitor. Uh, if you note, we note that uh, ravroxaban at higher doses should be taken with food to achieve uh, a desired therapeutic effect. Here is a meta-analysis performed by uh, Ruff et al, which demonstrates that as a class, the NOACs are, uh, are efficacious compared to warfarin for preventing uh, stroke or systemic embolism in patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation. Cardioversion uh, is used when uh, it can be used for persistent atrial fibrillation um, and helps restore sinus rhythm and patients before, anti before um, undergoing this elective procedure can be started on amiodarone and are anticoagulated to reduce the risk of a blood clot. There are some surgical options as well if all of these options fail um, and that is a, a maze procedure where a number of incisions are made to prevent re-entrant loops as well as uh, a number of interventional uh, opportunities available to help treat atrial fibrillation. Thank you for attending this Medicine Masterclass.